So let me invite you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, and we are picking up our study in verse 19 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 19 to 21. And I want to say here at the outset, um, because of what the Bible teaches us about God and about God's involvement in creation, I do not believe in coincidence. I believe in providence. Whenever something good and significant happens that was not planned by men, I don't think it was just an accident. I think it was the providential act of God. It was God orchestrating that good and surprising event. And we see examples of this in the Bible, like in the story of Ruth. When Ruth wanders into the field of Boaz to glean behind the harvesters, and it just so happened that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer for the family of Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law. That was no accident. That was providence. Or when Esther, a Jew living in a foreign land, became the queen just at the time that one of the king's men was seeking to destroy the Jewish people. Remember she was told, maybe, perhaps, you were put in this position for such a time as this. And we would say, absolutely, she was. That was no mere coincidence. That was providence. And it was not coincidence that in the midst of all the uncertainty and anxiety early on in the pandemic last year, we just so happened to find ourselves in Romans chapter 8, one of the most assurance-giving, comfort-giving chapters in all of the Bible. And I don't believe that it is a coincidence that at this moment in time that we are in Romans chapter 12, or that next Sunday, just a few days after one of the most contentious and contested inaugurations in our nation's history, we will be in Romans chapter 13, which talks about the Christian response to the governing authorities. I could not have planned this. I started preaching from the book of Romans in January of 2019, two years ago almost. I could not have planned for us to be in Romans chapter 8 last spring, nor foreseen how encouraging and life-giving and strengthening that would be, how desperately we would need that. And I did not plan for us to be in Romans 12 and 13 in January of 2021, nor could I or anyone else have foreseen the events that have taken place and that will soon take place and our need to be reminded of what the Bible says about how Christians should live in a hostile world. And so I want to look at these verses this morning with expectation, with eagerness, with open ears, with an open heart, with an open mind, with a desire to hear what God has to say for us, to us. We should always be doing that every Sunday. But as I looked at and thought about and prepared to preach from these verses over the last several days, I could not help but think about all the things that are going on around us and how we as Christians 
ought to be thinking about and responding to these various troubling situations. So here's what Paul says in Romans 12, verses 19 to 21. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, these verses, along with much of chapter 12, are about the ethics of the kingdom. We believe that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King, that He's the King of kings, and that all who belong to Jesus, all who believe in Jesus, have been welcomed into the kingdom of God. That our ultimate authority is God Himself. And Jesus has made very clear, both by his words and by his actions, how he wants the people of his kingdom to act, how he wants us to live. And so if we have been received by grace through faith into that kingdom and we confess Jesus as our king, then we are are the people who he's talking to and the people who ought to be saying, we want, by your help, by your grace, to live the kind of life that you are calling us to live, that you are teaching us to live, that you are modeling for us by the way that you lived. So Paul has been telling us in Romans chapter 12 that the one of the main things that ought to um, set Christians apart and ought to uh, distinguish Christians is our love. Our love for one another, just as Jesus said, the way you're, people are going to know you're my disciples is by the way that you love one another, and also our love for our enemies. Jesus taught us to pray for those who persecute us. Paul says in verse 14 that we're to bless those who persecute us and not to curse them. He told us in verse 17 to repay no one evil for evil. And now in verse 19, he warns us, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Now, why would he even need to say that? Why would Paul need to tell Christians, don't ever avenge yourselves? He needed to say that because he knew that Christians were living in a world that was hostile toward them, toward what they believed, toward the Savior that they follow. And they follow, we follow a crucified Messiah, a persecuted king. Paul was writing to uh, people in a situation, obviously, that was much more hostile than what we live in. Right in the first century, uh, we can read about in the book of Acts how Christians were persecuted, even in Israel. Apostles beaten and thrown in jail. Paul himself was no stranger to persecution, opposition. Right? Paul was stoned. Paul was thrown in jail. Paul put his life on the line every time he went into a new town and preached the gospel. He knew that Christians would find themselves in situations where it would be tempting to seek revenge for what had been done to them. And yet he says, never avenge yourselves. Don't ever curse the people who are persecuting you, but bless them. Pray for their welfare. Don't take vengeance, but instead, he says, 
Leave it to the wrath of God. Let God take care of meeting out justice. Let God deal with vengeance. How is God going to do that? When is God going to do that? Well, there are at least two ways we know from Scripture that God is going to bring wrath on those who do evil against his people. The most obvious one, right, is at the final judgment. Everybody is going to stand before the Lord. Everybody is going to give an account to God for what they've done. Rich, poor, king, regular old person, doesn't matter who we are, everybody is going to have to stand for the Lord, before the Lord, and everyone is going to give an account of what they've done. And everyone's sins and evil deeds will either be punished in hell or they will have been covered by the death of Jesus on the cross. Nobody can add anything to either of those. If a persecutor like Saul meets Jesus, repents, trusts in Christ, what happens to all the evil deeds that he did, all the Christians he persecuted before he became a Christian himself? All that evil was covered by the death of Jesus. Jesus suffered the just penalty for all of that. And nobody can add to that. Nobody need add to that. If Saul had not repented, if he had not trusted in Christ, then he would have suffered the just penalty for those sins himself. So, in the end, in the final reckoning, God will make sure that every evil deed is justly punished, one way or the other. But that's not the only way. Paul is also going to tell us in just a few verses, in chapter 13, verse 4, that God also meets out judgment in the here and now. And he does that through the state, through the government. Verse 4 says, talking about the, the one who's in authority, he says, He is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Now listen to this. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. The governing authorities are servants, instruments in the hand of God to meet out judgment and even God's wrath on evildoers. Now, that does not mean that everything the government does is sanctioned by God. That does not mean that everything the government does is right or good and so on. I mean, we know that, right? But what Paul is saying is that God uses those who are in authority to punish those who do evil. And they may not even be aware that that's what they're doing. They may not think of themselves as servants of God. They may not think, I'm doing this because this is what God says is right, and this is what God says is the right punishment to mete out. You go back to Isaiah chapter 45. You don't have to turn there right now, but go, go read Isaiah 45 or um, go read uh, Isaiah 10. God uses the king of Assyria in Isaiah 10 to punish Israel for Israel's wickedness. But the king of Assyria doesn't know that's why he's attacking Israel. He's just doing what he wants to do. He's just devouring another nation because he thinks he's so great. And then God's going to turn around and punish the king of Assyria for his arrogance. 
in Isaiah 45, it talks about how in the future, and this happens later in Ezra chapter 1, that God is going to use a king named Cyrus to deliver his people from exile and send them back to Jerusalem. And there they rebuild the temple and sort of reestablish the nation of Israel in the promised land. God uses governing authorities. He uses kings and others, governors and so on. He uses them to mete out judgment, to bring wrath on those who do evil, even in the here and now. One of the many things that that means is that when Paul says, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, that does not mean that if someone breaks into your house and assaults you, that you should not call the police. You should call the police. That's what they're there for. That's why God has put those authorities in place in order for evil to be punished. Again, it doesn't always happen perfectly. It's not always done rightly. Oftentimes, people with that power abuse it, misuse it. But in general, that's how it's supposed to work. And that's one of the ways that God works. So we are not to avenge ourselves. We are to leave that to God, and that includes God working through the governing authorities. And then Paul explains why this is with a quote from Deuteronomy 30, 32. He says, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When we seek to take vengeance, when we seek revenge for an evil that has been done against us, we are trespassing on God's territory. That's his domain. That's his privilege. That's his prerogative. It's not ours. And one of the reasons why it's his and not ours is because God is perfectly just and we are not. Because God knows everything and we do not. Because God is able to make a perfectly just, perfectly right decision based on his perfect knowledge and his perfect righteousness, whereas when we seek revenge, we tend to overdo it, we tend to miss some of the key information, we tend to be blind to truths that are inconvenient for what we want to see happen and focus on only what fits our view of the scenario. We don't have the whole picture, right? Sometimes it's not that we don't want to know all the information. It's just that we don't have all the information. Even the most just of judges, human judges, don't always get it right because they don't know everything. We don't know everything. And we don't always know what the right judgment or punishment or whatever ought to be. But God does. That's his role. And so he says very plainly, vengeance is mine and I will repay. When we seek vengeance on our own then, what we are doing is we are saying to God, I don't trust you. I don't trust you to take care of this to my satisfaction. I don't trust you to do it soon enough. I don't trust you to do it thoroughly enough. And we don't want to say that. I don't think any of us wants to say that. So when we are tempted to pursue vengeance, these are the things Paul wants us to remember. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. We are not to avenge ourselves. We are to leave that to God. And God will see to it without fail. Sooner or later, 
There will be a reckoning. And God will do what is right and just. Now it's not enough. That, that sometimes can be hard enough. Right? If some serious evil has been done against you, it can be hard enough not to seek revenge. But Paul says that's not enough. There's more. Verse 20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, it is not enough simply not to seek vengeance. Instead, we must do good even to our enemies. We must show compassion even to those who hate us. We are not allowed to let our enemies go hungry or go thirsty. Even if we feel like that's what they deserve, we are told to feed them, give them something to drink. Paul didn't make that up either. And even if he was the only one who said it, we know he's speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking with the authority of Christ. But he's quoting here from Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 21 and 22. So Old Testament and New Testament. We're to do good to our enemies. There's, there's a law in the book of Exodus that says something like, if you see your enemy's ox in the ditch, you have to get it out. You can't walk by it and say, that's right, that's what you deserve. No, nope. you have to help him. Even if you know he wouldn't help you, it doesn't matter. You are to show compassion to your enemies. It, it's significant, I think, that what he mentions here is just, you know, basic decency. And he's not saying you have to empty half of your bank account for them. Give them something to eat if they're hungry. Give them something to drink if they're thirsty. Treat them like another human being. Treat them like someone made in the image and likeness of God. Even if they've given you reason, you feel like, to hate them, you are called to love them and show them compassion. Now, what about this bit at the end of verse 20, where he says, For by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. What is, what is that about? Are we supposed to be nice, or are we hoping something bad happens here? What? What is this talking about? And, um, as I was uh, reading and studying about this this week, it, it seems that there are two different ways that Christians have interpreted this last part of verse 20. Two, two different ways that people have tried to understand it. On the one hand, it seems contradictory, right, to say, show compassion to your enemies so that they will have burning coals heaped upon their head and something bad will happen to them. So Augustine, for example, explains it this way. He says, how can it be love to feed and nourish someone just in order to heap coals of fire on his head, assuming that coals of fire means some serious punishment? Therefore, we must understand that this means that we should provoke whoever does us harm to repentance by doing him a good turn. For the coals of fire serve to burn, in other words, to bring anguish to his spirit. So what Augustine is saying is that when it says, feed them, give them something to drink, because by so doing you will keep burning coals upon their head, what he's saying is that we're not trying to harm them by doing good to them. What we're doing is we're saying, we. When we 
serve and show compassion and show love to someone who has done evil to us, what we are doing is, more or less, we are arousing their conscience and, and causing them to experience shame, conflict, um, conviction, whatever, so that they are now hurting, in a sense, as they are uh, realizing how badly they have treated someone who, despite that bad treatment, is now doing something good to them. And it might just be that your good in the face of their evil is what brings them to repentance. That's what Augustine is saying that verse is about. On the other hand, there are, uh, well, first let's say, on the other hand, Heaping burning coals on somebody does sound like something pretty bad. It maybe even sounds like more than just you know, your conscience being uh, pricked by somebody else's conduct. It sounds like a form of judgment. And the Psalms are unabashed about, at times, calling for God's judgment to fall on the wicked. And there's even a passage in Psalm 140 that says this, As for the head of those who surround me, let the mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into fire, into miry pits, no more to rise. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. So which one is it? Is it do good in order to lead them to repentance? Or is it do good because the more good you do to them, if they continue in their evil, the worse their judgment is going to be? I'm not sure it's either or. It might be both. And one thing that is clear from the Bible is that Judgment is coming on the wicked. And that we are not to be embarrassed by that. It needs to happen. But, right along with that, our desire ought to be for people to repent and trust in Christ rather than be judged. Because for every single one of us, there is a time where if our life had come to an end before then, or Jesus had returned before then, we would have experienced the just penalty for our sins because we had not yet been brought to repentance and faith in Christ. And we're so glad that didn't happen to us. And we ought not to want that to happen to anybody else. But if someone refuses to repent, if they insist on continuing to do evil, they must and will suffer the just punishment for their sin. There cannot be a new heavens and new earth where there's nothing accursed, where there's no more sin, where there's no more death and punishment, no no more... No more mourning or crying or pain. That can't exist unless God punishes those who refuse to repent. There must be a hell, in other words, so that there can be a heaven. We hold those things in tension. We want people to be saved, but we also want an end to evil, and some people refuse to repent. But all that is ultimately in the hands of the Lord. One final verse, verse 21. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If we seek vengeance on our own, if we do evil to those who have done evil to us, if we repay evil for evil, in other words, 
we end up overcome by evil ourselves. Because if we repay evil for evil, we not only harm the other person, we harm ourselves in the process. Instead, Paul says, you must overcome evil with good. Those are your only two options. Either you become like the wicked by trying to give them what they deserve, or you do good to them despite their wickedness and let God deal with the judgment. Again, we need to consider the example that Christ left for us. When Christ came into the world, the eternal Son of God, taking on flesh, being born as a man, he was utterly surrounded by wickedness, by evil. Throughout his ministry, he did nothing but good. He healed, he cast out demons, he showed compassion, he fed hungry crowds of people, and yet virtually from the beginning, he was hounded, he was slandered, people were seeking to put him to death, they were laying traps for him, they were plotting against him, and in the end, they arrested him, he was betrayed, he was mocked, spit upon, crucified, put to death. If ever there was anybody who had a right, so to speak, to repay evil with evil, there he was. If anyone ever would have been justified in calling down fire from heaven upon his enemies, there he was. But as we read earlier from 1 Peter 2, when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he was mocked, he did not threaten, he didn't shake his fist, he didn't say, just you wait. He said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And he knew that some of the people who would do evil things to his own followers would one day call him Lord and have their sins wiped out by his death. It's not much time between the moment when Saul stood by while stones were being hurled at Stephen and the time when Saul picked up Stephen's mantle and preached the same gospel that Stephen died for. Jesus died in our place for our sin and, Peter says, as an example of how we should respond to unjust suffering and by his death he overcame evil with good. In that moment. He was doing the greatest good it was possible to do. He was showing the greatest act of love it was possible to show by laying down his own life. And the Bible says that it was in that moment that Satan was crushed. That Jesus triumphed over him. That he was cast out. And what Paul is calling us to do is to believe that the way Jesus did it is the best way, is the right way. That what Jesus did not only secured our salvation, but showed us how God's universe works. God did not create a world where you can return evil for evil and not harm yourself. 
He created a world where good triumphs over evil. Where self-sacrificial love is what will win the day. That is what Jesus and Paul are calling us to. That's what a genuinely Christian life is supposed to look like. As we said last week, none of us can do these things perfectly. We often fail, but we need to be clear in our minds and hearts at least about which side we're on. Are we going to say, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to do what I think is just, or are we going to say, by the grace of God, my aim is not to curse those who persecute me, not to repay evil for evil, and not to be overcome by evil. My aim is to follow in my Savior's footsteps and overcome evil with good.